Right. Good morning and welcome to this week's edition of Encompass Live. I am your host, Krista Porter, here at the Nebraska Library Commission. Encompass Live is the Commission's weekly webinar series where we cover a variety of topics that may be of interest to libraries. We broadcast the show live every Wednesday morning at 10 a.m. Central Time. But if you're unable to join us on Wednesdays, that's fine. We do record the show every week, as we are doing today, and that is then posted to our website. And I'll show you uh, at the end of today's show how you can navigate that and get to all of our archives. Both the live show and the recordings are free and open to anyone to watch. So please do share with your friends, family, neighbors, colleagues, anyone who you think might be interested in any of the topics we have on the show. Uh, for those of you who are not from Nebraska, the Nebraska Library Commission is the state agency for libraries. In other states, it may just be called the state library. Um, so we provide services to all types of libraries in our state. So you will find things on our show for all types of libraries. Um, topics for publics, academics, K-12, corrections, museums, archives, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> Anything in any type of library are really our only criteria that it is something to do with libraries. Um, something libraries are doing, something we think they could be doing. Um, we have Nebraska Library Commission staff that come in and do presentations sometimes about pro um, resources and services we offer here. And we sometimes bring in guest speakers, talk about uh, cool and interesting things they're doing um, across Nebraska and across the country. Um, before we get into today's show, I just wanna do a quick little aside um, and talk about our Library Commission website here and how what we are doing here at the Library Commission to help our libraries during the current uh, COVID-19 pandemic. We have here at the top of our web page a post that is pinned here, will always be here at the top, about the um, link to the resources we have. We also have a list we are maintaining, attempting to maintain as best we can about libraries that have closed, have opened, reopened, accommodationed, special accommodations made, Wi-Fi in the parking lot, uh, curbside pickup. Um, now, of course, things added to there to libraries reclosing because of opening too soon and new new outbreaks come up. Um, but we try to keep that up to date. Uh, there's a form libraries can fill out. We also have staff here, multiple staff that monitor social media and news reports and things to try and keep it as well up to date as we can. Um, if you are a library, um, check your status there. Let us know if anything needs to change. Uh, I just want to show you here on the post we have here for the resources, uh, there's um, a link to our list, a link to the form to use, uh, to report to us, and then some specific resources we've gathered depending on what you might be interested in, homeschooling, unemployment, et cetera. But specifically the page about libraries I wanted to highlight, this is for any library, anybody can go to this of course, there's a lot of resources here, anything we've found out about there that ALA is doing, IMLS, CDC, anybody doing things, OCLC, um, webinars, resources that are out there, we try to add to this as we learn of new things. Um, many, much of this is for any type of libraries. Some of it is specific to Nebraska libraries, about how to host meetings, that would be Nebraska specific statutes. Um, some example policies from libraries here in the state if you're looking to see what you wanna do. Um, all sorts of other resources. Um, so I just wanna make sure our libraries know this information is here. Let us know if you need anything else. If you are from uh, not from Nebraska, check your state library, your state library association. They may be offering the same kind of resources for you. So now I'm going to hand over presenter control to you, Carson. Thank you so much. Your slides up. Uh, so on to today's show. Should be able to show your screen. There we go. And it's doing it. Whoops. <laughs> That's all right. <laughs> I'm just going to let it go through its paces. I love how they it'll pop up a, a dialog box. Um, <laughs> sometimes. Um, yeah. Here we go. There's the full screen. All right. So today we are talking about the Toward Gigabit Libraries Toolkit. And um, we have a group of people here who have been working on it from, and there's a show we did about this um, last year. I think Holly, you mentioned it was in March was when you guys were last here. No, no. Uh, it, the oh, inception sure. was in March. But, oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. We did do oh, one we at one point. Time. We did do a previous one. Yes, last year, March 6th. Yes. So this okay. is a follow-up to a previous one um, in okay. March of 2019. Um, this is a great resource for people, but um, for libraries to use. What I'm going to do, I'm going to let you guys um, introduce yourself as you get to your parts and everything and just tell about what's going on now. That sounds Good. So we'll uh, we'll kick it off right now. Um, we are really excited. The last time that we gave a project update, um, I remember 
um, uh, calling this in from the road, presenting it from a hotel room. Um, <laughs> Not now. It's so nice. I'm actually as close to um, uh, Nebraska as I can be. And I, um, uh, I but first, let me introduce um, a co-project manager on this project, Stephanie Stenberg. Hi, everyone. I'm Stephanie Stenberg. I am the director of the Community Anchor Program at Internet2. And I'll tell you a little bit more about what that is in a minute. Wonderful. And I'm Carson Block. I'm a library technology consultant. I've been working in libraries for uh, getting close to 30 years, I think now. I've been a, a consultant for uh, 10 years. I'm based uh, near you in uh, Fort Collins, Colorado, but uh, usually travel uh, all over the country helping folks. We also want to give a, a nod to our founding team. Um, uh, Susanna Spellman um, uh, was part of uh, Internet2 at the time when this project began. Susanna has uh, gone to the private sector and is doing a wonderful, wonderful job there. And also to James Worley. James Worley uh, unfortunately passed away uh, just as the original project was uh, wrapping up. But James is close to, to all of us in this project and close to our hearts, uh, someone uh, who we miss um, uh, dearly. So. We're going to start by playing a video on the video about the Toward Gigabit Libraries project. I, I, we want to play it for you because it frames everything really well. This is actually, it's gone viral in terms of a library video because it's been played a thousand times. Uh, this is a lot, right, for a library video. But it covers everything. And it's also something that you can come back and look at later to remind yourself of all the things that we're going to talk about today. Whoops. That is really funny the way it does that. Let's go back to... Um, Let's go back to this. And sometimes the Google slide. Welcome. It's playing it. Let me let me get that up here again. Sorry about that. We're gonna just gonna blaze through these again and see if we can get this to play. There we go. And it did it when we tested it. Welcome. This video is designed to give you an ultra quick overview of how to use the Toward Gigabit Libraries toolkit. You'll be up and running in no time. The Toolkit is a free open source technology learning, diagnostic, and advocacy tool designed for public and tribal libraries in the US. But the Toolkit can be used just about anywhere in the world. The Toolkit will guide you through a series of questions about your technology environment and provide you with all the information you need to answer the questions. The Toolkit is an excellent way to diagnose and fix problems that you may be having with your library technology. Some libraries have found it especially useful in preparing for e-rate requests, budget cycles, and even in helping open up lines of communication between library staff and tech workers. Best of all, you do not need to be a techie to use the toolkit. While it's always helpful to have someone with technical knowledge to assist, this toolkit was piloted with more than 60 rural and tribal libraries in 11 states to ensure that it is as simple as possible for you to use. The toolkit is divided into several key sections covering the types of technical challenges you're likely to encounter in your library and ways to solve those challenges. In the technology inventory section, you will find and understand some of the key pieces of the technology inside your library, including your network, computers, and other important technology components. This inventory will help you understand what sort of equipment you have now and provide a basis to determine if you need different or additional equipment for the future. In the broadband services and activities section, the types of broadband services and applications are discussed in order to ensure that you have sufficient bandwidth to support patron and staff use of various devices and applications, both today and into the future. Technology in libraries is more than just a collection of gear. People, including library staff and those who provide technical support, are just as important. In the Broadband Technical Operations Support section, you will learn more about the people who help make technology available in your library and determine if there are any areas where you could benefit from additional support. Technology expenses are important budget considerations for all libraries. In the Broadband Funding section, you'll learn about several opportunities available to help provide funding for your library broadband connectivity. The topics listed in the Additional Resources and Best Practices section are designed to provide you even more insight and resources into improving your library's broadband connectivity and services. You may find these items helpful in gaining a better understanding of your broadband connection, data network, and computers. The toolkit also has a handy glossary section at the end for quick lookups of technical terms. 
And don't worry about completing the toolkit from end to end. It is designed to address the most common technology issues in libraries, so it does cover a lot of ground. You may need to only work through the sections that are the most important to you. After you've completed the toolkit, you can use another document called the Broadband Improvement Plan to create your own long-term and short-term strategies to improve your technology. Wondering how to find the toolkit materials? Everything is available at our website. The toolkit is free and open source. And if you like, you are free to use anything from the toolkit and mix it into other documents. This may be especially useful for state library organizations, rural and education networks, library consortiums, and others who would like to customize the toolkit materials. After you've used the toolkit and the broadband improvement plan, we would love to hear from you. Click on the link in the comments section of this video to share your experiences. Now, grab the toolkit and make it your own. So what's really funny about, about the, the message in there is we, of course, created that overview at the end of the project to, to make sure we spread the word about this, the, the availability of this toolkit. A lot of people used it and no one really told us. They just took the ball and ran with it. And so we're delighted um, uh, uh, with that. Um, before we go on, though, we want you to know more about uh, the team uh, that we have um, and, and the organizations uh, coming together to put this together. And so I'm going to hand this over to Stephanie to talk to us about Internet 2. What is Internet 2, Stephanie? Yes, what is Internet 2 and why is it involved with libraries? Well, I will tell you. So Internet 2 exists and it you probably have used it before, but you don't even know it. Internet 2 is basically a high, the high speed Internet backbone for higher education and community anchor institutions like K-12 schools, libraries, museums, state and local governments and healthcare systems. Um, it's a member driven advanced technology community and was founded by the nation's leading higher education institutions in 1996. And really, Internet 2 is more than that Internet backbone. What it really is, is that community. It's a collaborative community where the United States research and education organizations can solve common tech challenges and develop innovative solutions. So um, that's showing you a little bit of our routes there. And then um, specifically where Internet 2 ties to libraries is through the Community Anchor Program. And that's what I'm the director of. So as you can see, we have some connectivity statistics. Um, we connect a lot of the smaller four-year colleges and universities, community colleges, K-12 schools, and public libraries across the nation. That's about 25% of them throughout the nation. Um, we connect those, we connect state and regional research and education networks like Network Nebraska that serve over 100,000 of those community anchor institutions. So in addition to serving libraries, through IMLS funded research, we also help K-12 schools in a lot of ways. Um, one of the ways is we provide distance learning um, through our Presidential Primary Sources Project where we connect schools and libraries with um, presidential historians and museums um, to learn about our nation's presidents. So that's a fun program we run. And so I'll tell you about our uh, Toward Gigabit Libraries initial grant. Or oh, Carson is. Well, I we can we can both do it. Um, uh, the um, it, so this started out uh, back in 2016, spring of 2016. Um, uh, uh, Internet Two was awarded this grant, and and um, uh, James and Susanna had gotten a hold of me to be part of that uh, since I had done a lot of work uh, in uh, rural communities and around connectivity and training and stuff like that. So it was a $250,000 grant. Um, it turned into a three-year grant to develop a training curriculum and a self-assessment self material, this toolkit for library broadband infrastructure. And of course, our target, our audience, very rural and tribal libraries. And our, our partners included the, uh, like represented in Nebraska. We're gonna talk a little bit more about that. We started off strong in Nebraska. Uh, with joining together state library offices and these research and education or r and &E network. Um, we had a project goal of reaching at least 30 libraries to pilot this idea in because it was just an idea. We were stingy. We were able to reach at least 60 because we watched our budget and we knew that the best effectiveness for this toolkit happened by getting out in the field. So we made that happen. 
And so a little bit about how um, uh, it was developed is we brought together uh, subject matter experts uh, from rural and tribal libraries, state library agencies, uh, and we, we kind of uh, got together, I mean, literally got together uh, in a room um, for a day and a half uh, and hammered out needs, details, approaches, ideas, and, and things like that. And, and these SMEs or sm subject matter experts uh, stayed with us uh, as uh, to consult with throughout the entire projects. And, uh, and what we did is we updated the materials based on the input we received. And so as soon as we heard, uh, we were actively uh, seeking uh, how well things were working or uh, how they weren't as we did the pilots. And immediately, that influenced the toolkit itself. And then finally, we finalized and uh, released the toolkit into the wild, and uh, that's where it is now. Now, the toolkit itself, uh, I'm gonna recap some of the stuff in the video, but um, uh, we can talk a little bit more directly about that. It's doing three things at the same time, and it's doing a pretty good job uh, of it. Uh, on its face, it's an educational workbook. So if you're in a small library, you downloaded the toolkit, you might be put off a little bit by how thick it looks. Don't worry. It, it's it's uh, once you open up the first page, you'll see that it's not scary. But but it's supposed to be an educational workbook. The other function is to, uh, to that workbook to be a self-assessment tool. So any library, whether you're rural or tribal, can uh, use this information um, uh, to assess your technology conditions. The other is to be an advocacy platform because the more you know about your technology, the more you can advocate for improvements. And frankly, we all need improvements to our technology. So we, we wanted it to, to operate on those, um, uh, those levels. So the, um, the toolkit components and process, um, uh, we had these different areas. And I'm gonna go over those, uh, they're listed right here, but I'm gonna go ahead and go over those um, uh, right now. Um, First of all, though, the way the toolkit is structured is probably its greatest strength. Um, it's kind of like um, um, a test in which you're told the answers to, right? So uh, there's a question um, that's around specific area of technology, such as on this, uh, this first question we're showing here, uh, what type of broadband connection do you have? And there's several different options that you can choose, um, DSL, cable modem, fiber, wireless, satellite, or other. Um, and then the question is followed by information that you can use to answer. The question. So it's not a test of your knowledge, it's a way for you to learn uh, through this Q&A approach um, what your technology is in your library and how uh, what, what you might need. Um, the tool itself um, uh, from the beginning has been a free open source um, a tool and I was laughing at the end of the video because I said Right, we said, please let us know if you if you use this. We want to hear from you. People just used it. Who has time to tell us that they're using it? And, and so uh, we've we've been able to kind of keep tabs, but we know that there's a lot of use of this toolkit that we don't even know about. This is super useful though um, in preparing for E-rate requests and budget cycles, um, and especially as a tool to help in open communications between library staff and tech workers. And when Holly and Tom um, uh, uh, share their uh, their experiences in, in a moment, uh, they can talk a little bit more about that. But this is one of the strengths that we found is that the toolkit gave a common um, vocabulary and common knowledge to both library people and tech people. And sometimes for the first time ever, they were able to talk directly about the same thing at the same time. So it was very, very um, uh, powerful. Uh, also, um, the toolkit itself, it, it has to be the size that it is because there's so many different possible situations that you might have in your library. We need to make sure that that's in the toolkit, but you don't have to do the whole thing. You can just do the things that, that you need uh, the most. And it was written so that if you don't need to be a, a technician or a techie to understand it, it's written in plain language and it's accessible as uh, we could uh, be. And so about the tool, the, the first section is a technology inventory about the library. And I don't know if you've ever done a tech inventory before of your library. It just, even by walking around and counting stuff and making note of what you have can be a very powerful way to put this front of mind. And of course, the toolkit's gonna take you well beyond that because we wanna know uh, how it's working as well. Uh, you wanna know how it's working as well. And so the toolkit guides you through uh, your broadband connection, your network devices, the things that make your connection work, uh, wired network and power. Power is very important and especially in older libraries, we just didn't have enough. We never envisioned a, play, a time when all patrons would need to plug in their mobile devices when they came in. 
Uh, so a lot of places need help with power. A wireless network and computer and end user devices. The next section is, is specifically about broadband services and activities. So this includes the need, uh, the bandwidth needs that you might have, uh, things like hotspot lending, things like internet filters and different services that you might be, uh, other services that you might be uh, offering. Uh, the next is super important because this is where the ball gets dropped so often, and this is technical operational support for your technology. And so this is a place to inventory and really think about uh, the, the access to and the quality of uh, your tech support. So that's the folks available, uh, staff training re resources, uh, technical support that you might get from your ISP, some questions about their ser about service requests uh, and your relationship with your ISP. ISP stands for Internet Service Provider. And also talking about things like uh, service guarantees, understanding what you were promised from your service provider, and ways to see if you're getting what you were promised in terms of the performance of your connection. Um, usually this comes up at first, but it's it's uh, it's uh, it's not first. It's just one of the things that we have to think about, and that's broadband funding. Um, uh, and we want to make sure that everyone knows what they're paying and um, uh, what they're getting for what they're paying but also entering uh, things about E-rate. And E-rate, of course, is a universal service fund that offers discounts uh, to libraries and schools uh, based on the percentage of school lunch program in uh, the community that's served. And so uh, in some cases, especially rural areas, there are significant discounts on uh, not just the connection to the internet, but also the internal equipment, the routers, the switches, the wirings, et cetera, um, that can be uh, made available. And we also talk about other, other funding sources to consider. Um, the final section is a bunch of links uh, because in the process of putting the toolkit together, of course, there are many, many tentacles to this uh, octopus um, of, of connectivity and technology. And so we wanted to round up things that would be helpful, at least as starting points. Um, and this would be E-rate, content filtering, uh, additional uh, broadband resources, uh, free technology training uh, at the time, uh, data backup, and internet use policies. Now, I've got to say, in every part of the toolkit, especially the first parts where we're asking questions and answers, we were very conservative over what links we shared because, of course, on the web, links disappear overnight. Um, and so we, we wanted to not have too many links uh, there. Um, uh, part of our new grant that we'll tell you about in a minute is actually updating because this section of the toolkit actually needs some updating. Uh, resources are still available, but they've moved. Uh, we figured that would happen, but nonetheless, um, keeping up with that is difficult, right? And then finally, for, for folks who consider themselves newbies, it's really powerful to know what a word means, right? So we've we included a glossary that will will help with the most common and the most basic terms. Something that uh, is aimed at our our, uh, our worker in a small rural or tribal library to quickly look something up as they're having conversations or as they're learning about their technology. Now um, we had. Uh, so many site visits, right? We had these 60 site visits. And this is a picture, again, of, of where we were able to go. The, the blue, of course, is the um, public libraries. The orange are tribal libraries. Even though I think in Alaska, those are there's a little mix um, uh, of those uh, there. We took uh, information as well as we were going because we needed to know how we were performing. Uh, we also wanted to make sure that we were hitting the right libraries. So you can look at a map like this and go, oh, cool. So how do I know from this distance if that, those are the right sorts of libraries? Um, I've been, because of my experience in working with rural um, uh, libraries, I, I've been in, in situations where the most needy library perhaps was not the one getting the visit. Um, but instead, the, the library who was the quickest on the draw to ask for the visit was getting it. This was in previous um, um, uh, programs. And, and that was always uh, regrettable to go out to a library that actually had resources, they had a technology person, uh, and they had funding. And, and then to go out and spend time with them, and, and because of that, it wasn't able to spend time with someone who had nothing, right? So we wanted to build that in from the beginning to make sure that we were addressing the needs of the folks who needed this the most, even though this was just a pilot at the time. We wanted to make sure we were hitting those libraries. So um, as you can see, most of the libraries that we, we visited were um, uh, not part of, uh, uh, of something bigger. So they were their own standalone thing. 
Um, uh, this chart indicates that, uh, uh, that the frequency of IT and technical support for the majority of the libraries was at the bottom, right? It wasn't huge, um, including none, <laughs> right? Um, including that, that, that green slice that says never, but, but as you can see, most of these libraries were uh, in needs. Um, the other thing is asking the library staff who we were working with, what is your current level of expertise around this? And, and as you can see, most of it is was no to limited amount of expertise. So that means there's a lot of need, right? And that also ups the ante because we're talking about bringing technical information to uh, folks who are considering themselves non-technical. And that was one of our targets. We wanted to bridge that and make sure that we, um, we address that. So you would think with those, um, and, I, and I have to say, frankly, like with, with, the, the, with the folks that we were able to target, when we visited on the toolkit, in some cases, people weren't sure they wanted to see us or not. They were a little intimidated um, uh, by having a, a tech day um, uh, and, and having to answer technical questions. Uh, we also asked about folks' experience with the pilot program. Um, and um, we had so much um, uh, positive experiences, right? People said they had a great time. In fact, as soon as we got there and we started working through the toolkit and people realized it was not that difficult to do, it was hard to leave. <laughs> They would not want us to leave. It was like that's when the that's when the food started coming out and uh, the the ideas of how we think we could save time in our next drive so we could stay a little longer. And that was really that was really the best indicator that we that that, that the toolkits were working. Um, this is my favorite slide. I've never seen this before. I've been working in libraries for a long time. I've never seen a unanimous recommendation for something like this, especially something so difficult. And this is, would you recommend this pilot process to other libraries? Unanimously, yes. And so as we were receiving this feedback, we knew that we were on the right track and we kept on building onto that right track. And speaking of that right track, Stephanie, I've been talking for so long. Um, I'll give you a break. Yes, tell us what's been going on since the toolkit wrapped up. So the toolkit has just, Really, it's a testament to the hard work of Carson and James and Susanna and all of our partners that it's continued to have a really great impact on so many organizations, so many libraries. Um, you'll see this is a list of just some of the organizations we've partnered with, given presentations to. And um, I'll give you an example. Um, I know the Montana State Librarian, Jenny Stapp, implemented use of the toolkit in 115 of Montana's 117 libraries. And so using that, um, they discovered that actually 98% of their public libraries serving less than 50,000 people reported speeds below the FCC's bandwidth target of 100 megabits per second. So they, they're using the toolkit to gather all this data and use it for funding and to plan, um, which is just, phenomenal we're so proud of um the fact that the toolkit can help libraries all over so that brings us to the new grant we had the Tor gigabit libraries toolkit grant that expired it still has a life of its own and we thought we could help bring the toolkit to more rural libraries more tribal libraries and actually expand it into another segment of the library population, which is the tech deserts and urban areas where they might not have the resources um, to do some of these things. And we are going to be just scaling up the toolkit, looking at it, making it more accessible to people, updating those links like Carson talked about, and really continuing those partnerships with people on the state library side and the research and education network side as well. So we got a ton of letters of support, which was really great. And, and again, a testament to the great work done on the Tor Gigabit Libraries Toolkit. Um, so you're looking at not only a list of um, the, the organizations that gave us letters of support, you're probably looking at a skeleton crew of our advisory group we're working to build right now as well, hoping to get representatives from both the tribal and rural and urban uh, library communities. And this was such a, um, a a testament again to the I think the importance and the effectiveness of the tool because um, uh, and Stephanie uh, joined the project um, uh, after uh, 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 after Susanna left and so um, uh, 
Stephanie was part of that transition and um, it can probably attest to how, um, especially at the time, like James and I, we just had our heads down working all the time. <laughs> you know, we weren't, um, I, I would say that our marketing of this was not, was non-existent. You know, we were just like working and getting out in the field. And I remember when we gave a presentation to COSLA, uh, the, the Chief Officers of Library Organizations uh, workshop, and we told them about this and we got this flood of new requests to go and visit that we couldn't support. Uh, we tried and, 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 and in many ways we were able to support other efforts there. Um, but, it, but it really showed that this start, struck a nerve and it was worthy of this work, of this hard work uh, that, we were, that we were doing. Um, so now let's, let's change our focus from all the broad stuff into something very much at home for you. Um, and that is Nebraska. These, this is the map of our site, our first stops in the, the whole toolkit process. Um, uh, I did the, the, the one on the far, far west part of the state, Susanna did the rest and the other, the other common people in both of these are our next guests from the great state, <laughs> Nebraska, Holly Walt and Tom Rolfs. And we'll also talk to Krista, who I don't think usually is pulled into this stuff, but we're gonna to talk to Krista yeah. too. Um, but I would like to to hand this over um, and we'll we'll have a conversation style too. Um, but I wanna say for for Nebraska that, that, that Holly and Tom are our dream team when it comes to uh, the idea of teaming up uh, someone from the state library, Holly, and somebody from an RE network, Tom, to mix uh, knowledge and expertise of, of the clients and uh, some of the technology, and to use that to be a very powerful team. And in so many ways, Tom and Holly set the standard uh, for how this could work and how it should work. And this is baked in to our next grant, and this is gonna be formalized in, in making formal relationships here where they didn't exist. We, Stephanie and I wanna thank you both so much for just being who you are because you didn't do this on purpose. You're just awesome people. And put, uh, you did do it on purpose, but it's because you're awesome people. And <laughs> and it, it happened. I, I'm, I'm talking out of both sides of my mouth here, but um, thank you for doing that because it, it has made a huge difference and it's set a standard uh, for others to follow. So tell us a little bit more about your experiences with the toolkit. Well, I'll start um, as a, uh... Working with Tom was uh, great. He actually approached me uh, to uh, be included, uh, the Library Commission to be included in the grant. And um, we started out, uh, I guess I would call it, and I still see it that way. I reviewed the toolkit last night and it's, um, it has improvements. It has some things that do need to be updated in it, I noticed. Yes. <laughs> but yeah. uh, but we, yes. uh, we started out and I guess when I was visiting with the uh, Suzanne, I, my comment was, it's like going to the library and being around the kitchen table. And that's how we really presented it. I think Tom and I, you know, even though I don't have uh, rural roots, I, I feel like I, I can communicate in that level. And so that was wonderful experience. Uh, found it to be pretty detailed and um, for getting enough information to provide to the library to say, yeah, I can answer that question. And the other piece, I just kind of came upon it while we were uh, listening is, I also think um, sometimes when you have somebody from state library or a tech person come into a rural library, right away that library director says, oh, I don't know anything, just go ahead and do what you want. But to come in, for the two of us to come in with a tool that was developed by somebody else that was to be helpful uh, to help them to understand and uh, empower them to have knowledge about their technology uh, was, uh, I think it was also an asset for us instead of having our own homegrown material to do that. Um, anyway, we um, and give Tom a chance to visit too about this, but uh, as a team going in there too, um, we have some great stories and Tom, I, I hope you will potentially give a highlight of your story in Atkinson, Nebraska. Um, there was intrepidation at, in the beginning um, and most of the time we visited with one librarian or two librarians and uh, Tom had a, a staff colleague came, came along with him one time to the visit. And then when uh, Carson visited with Gearing, it was wonderful. We had all four of the main library staff working with us in the basement, going through this uh, workbook, had a, 
absolutely fabulous time, but they learned so much. And um, and in all in all, as they learned, it, it is, as Carson said, it's almost like they don't want you to leave. Um, so that's a testament to how it's put together and, and it can be delivered. Tom, do you have some comments? I sure do. <laughs> <laughs> of course. <laughs> so you don't run over 1,500 miles around the state with all that windshield time and not have some stories to tell. But um, one of our library candidates who shall remain nameless told Holly in confidence before our arrival, I'll do this on one condition as long as you don't do anything with E-rate. <laughs> and so, okay, I'll, she whispered that to me, so I'll take that on as a challenge. We sat down at 9 a.m. at this library, and by 1 p.m., uh, she had updated or acquired her FCC number, uh, reactivated her role in EPIC, the E-rate portal, um, had just signed an agreement with the vendor. I found a contact. She she negated that agreement, floated a Form 470, and 28 days later, she had a new expanded service with 70% discount. Yay. So that was in wow. one four hour, and it didn't take that long, it took about 90 minutes, but it it's really the power of the toolkit, earning trust, mm -hmm. and then giving us the ability to sit down one-on-one -on -one with a library director who may be harboring either fear or resistance or, or previous experiences that were not great. And we know that this is doable, right? Because we do it on Network Nebraska every day. We have mm -hmm. 293 fiber connected entities, all of our school districts for fiber. So I looked at libraries as this is an important challenge for rural Nebraska because education is in my job title. Mm -hmm. Our homework app in the state probably 30,000 students without any internet at home. They drive into town, they go to the library parking lot and they're greeted by, in many cases, less than 24 megabits down. So okay. not acceptable. <laughs> so let's, mm -hmm. we've got a lot of work to do. Holly's not going to be allowed to retire. <laughs> Chris is gonna be doing a lot more training, but our, our job and we have some other exciting projects to quickly mm -hmm. highlight is to get more libraries connected with fiber and the toolkit's an important pathway to that understanding. I'm I, glad I wanna, you said, oh, oh, sorry, go, go, go. Because that, that's why I've included the toolkit in my E-rate training since it was put out. So um, last year, the year before, as soon as I knew about it, it's, it's part of the E-rate training that I do every year for our libraries. It's on my E-rate website. Go here, figure out before you start anything, go here and figure out what you got figure out what you could do, and then bring that along with you when you go into looking for um, applying for E-rate and what you might want to um, ask for. And I just want to mention one thing too, it's the relationships in my mind that you build as a, as a uh, agency for the state, because oftentimes it's edicts and things that come down or they're asking you for something again. And we were offering that. And an example of that was what I was visiting earlier with the, the rest of you about that our very first library who worked with the toolkit, um, she uh, she was the very first and she she was pretty anxious about things. But although she did service cookies and I think some pop or juice when we were there, which was wonderful. We went on, Tom and I have worked um, with an, an IMLS uh, grant for the, uh, the, we called it the, the Sparks grant and it had a long name and, and Tom might be able to state it out, but basically it was yeah. using a fixed, <laughs> fixed base wireless uh, uh, from the school to the library for a hotspot. And then we had two computers, desktop computers in the hotspot. Uh, this this library, she also uh, was a part of that, you know, very easily. And she attended our workshop yesterday because she's getting ready to retire. And I said to her, I said, don't retire before we get, uh, we, we're able to get uh, fiber to that library. And she says, I, I think I can do that. I'm going to stay on. <laughs> and then we find out between Tom and I in a conversation later that we both told her the same thing. We said, they'll name that library, rename that library after you when you do that. <laughs> so ironically, we do have a same wavelength. But I'm, what I think is important yes, is, 
that sure. relationship that you're you're able to put together because all that other stuff is in there and it happens and they do know this information and and I've also used it um, for continuing education it's offered uh, on their own and then in at the beginning of the year, we hired another individual, uh, not a new position, but redefined a position to work with, basically, it's category two, uh, because we know if we bring fiber to these libraries, that's great, but a lot of them have very old network equipment. We had a library that uh, has got fiber, and then um, we investigated and, and had a 10-year-old router in there, and because they couldn't figure out why aren't why aren't we receiving this inside. These are those basic things that a non-tech person may not know, and so um, we didn't use a toolkit for that, but that was, this is the kind of an idea as preparation for um, as we move to fiber with some of our, you know, with, as Tom said, we have other projects that are going on to within I, the I want, state. It, Yes, and before we talk about the Sparks grant, I actually wanted to ask you both about um, or all three because this has this folds into to, to E rate as well. Um, I've been working. Uh, I've actually been I've been supporting the the toolkit um, since the grant ended um, because people have been using it. They 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 need things uh, uh, done. And um, I was working with two states recently with CARES Act funding to receive CARES Act funding. Um, a library needs to also comply with CEPA, uh, the Children's Internet Protection Act. Yes. And so there was a lot of stress around this in some of the clients I was working with because uh, based on library policy, they had rejected any um, um, uh, compliance with CEPA. With this funding, they needed to understand a little bit better what SEPA compliance meant. And so uh, using uh, the diagram, the, the network diagram part of the toolkit, um, I was able to illustrate very quickly, you know, number, number one, to say, sorry, um, this is part of it. Um, the difference uh, b between now and in the past is that the filtering systems work better. I was able to do a quick survey of my of, of folks that I know to, to look at performance of filters, okay. but to get that out of the way. And to, to go back and say, here's the deal. If you want the CARES Act funding, you do have to uh, rely on that. And so now, if it's a, if that, it starts with a policy decision. Now, the technical support or the technical piece to support the decision would be how does filtering work? And so I was able to show how the diagram could illustrate uh, the three major types of filtering approaches and what would be feasible or unfeasible for a particular library's situation. So I just wanted to show that really quickly, but I, I, I would love to hear other examples where you've been able to use that basic concept where maybe it wasn't useful before to a person and all of a sudden it became really important to understand how this stuff works. Mm. Well, I think you're you're correct. And for, for us um, at the Library Commission, we are, uh, primarily hands off on filtering that, you know, the, that we, yes, filter and you have to filter, but we aren't doing any types of recommendations. Um, I do have a idea. I haven't, uh, and you'll hear it first <laughs> here, but um, we've been um, toying around with the idea of my, my new colleague and I is that we would like to see pockets where we have a library who's using a filtering system and they're happy with it and have them do a presentation in the area to help other libraries to see what they do and what they use as mm -hmm. opposed to keep you know to not have the library commission necessarily endorsing anything so this is a concept that we're we're toying with to do with um, the libraries as we mm -hmm. hopefully increase the the participation in e rate and there's an interesting dovetail with the sparks grant when the school district and library partnered <clears throat> and that was a requirement, by the way, for their eligibility. We were increasing the external internet into the hotspot by 400 to 1500 percent. So the Wymore example that Holly mentioned, after we put in a brand new 85 foot tall telephone pole <laughs> to shoot over the oak trees to the school, um, she went from six megabits off the water tower up to a thousand meg into wow. that hot spot. Nice. So that is mm -hmm. just absolutely extraordinary. But yeah. the wireless access point terminating in the library was an extension of the school network. Mm -hmm. So there are more sophisticated controller modules, software, metrics, uh, filtering policies, and all that could have been applied to that wireless access point, which was 
reasonably foreign to a small rural library that has a single two band router, for instance. Mm -hmm. So it's not that they couldn't get there, but this aspect of their network became an extension of the school and could be managed by the school district. So we're going to retain that model. Mm -hmm. You know, obviously we're hoping for fiber at every library, right? But that's not going to be applicable in every situation. Mm -hmm. But we could fully flush out these other relationships where the school district and library, you know, are within uh, bird's eye view, line of sight, and we can drop a thousand meg in there with, with no problem as an addition to their existing network so and to, to focus on filtering again about related to that is it is interesting like you say i mean there's adversity there's um trepidation a lot of folks that have um, maybe used d-rate in the past the filtering was pretty archaic it's much different now um so we would we would be offering with the Sparks grant this opportunity to have this um, high-speed internet in the in the library, but of course it would be filtered. And some of the uh, ESUs or the schools said, "No problem. Um, you can uh, you uh, we don't care if other people and other patrons use this in the library." And I never heard anyone say, "Well, I I'm just upset that this is filtered," you know, and and they because they just wanted faster speed. Mm -hmm. And I think the other thing that we've we've come to believe is with that faster speed is that a lot of libraries in rural areas, and we're facing this with this idea of uh, trying to increase the fiber um, uh, to the to the libraries currently in Nebraska. They don't know what faster speed is, and that's another thing that the Sparks grant offered. Right. We were in a library and having an open house, and we asked a student to say come up and and do a uh, demonstration of what she would be doing at school and so the adults all gathered around her and they just couldn't believe how fast those pages updated you know so that's part of I think what we need to do too with you know helping the library not only understand what they have but what they don't have and yes they could utilize what they don't have <laughs> And please tell us a little bit, and I, I know that we kind of teased the Sparks grant, but for, for those not familiar with it, tell us a little bit more, uh, kind of like a backup a little bit, and tell us a little bit more about the Sparks uh, grant itself. We'll let Tom do that, please. So I'm not an IMLS expert, but it's a smaller <laughs> grant cycle that they had in that time period for $25,000 maximum. So how do you test out a brand new concept or a venture, a partnership? Uh, against uh, you know the three main priorities of IMLS, so we selected this concept that had been rolling around in our heads. All the school districts are fiber. Within a mile to two miles is a library that's probably less than 24 meg. They're both public entities drawing tax dollars, and guess what? They've never worked together. <laughs> so what if we, you know, promise to give them up to five thousand dollars for connectivity and two brand new desktop computers. We knew that that would get their attention. Mm -hmm. And if they would just agree to work with the school superintendent to do this short-term relationship to test out this concept, shaboom, shebang. And then it was six site visits. The governor ended up visiting two of them and uh, the rest is kind of history. Now it was a short-term engagement, 12 month program project. And then at the end they were they were faced with the decision, do we want to make this a long-term relationship? Uh, do we want to disconnect? They obviously get to keep the computers and they could keep the connection, uh, but that was something they were faced with then in 2019. Um, so anyway, that led to the next project that we've been working on, which is the Nebraska Special Construction Matching Fund won't go into all the build up details, but the Public Service Commission has committed a million dollars over four years for Nebraska to become the 25th state to allow the 10% match on special construction of fiber. Ah. Uh, Krista and Holly are doing that training right now from the Library Commission, and mm -hmm. we're recruiting participants. We'll bid their circuits this fall, and then July 1, 2021 will be the first service start date on the new fiber for as many libraries as express interest. So that kind of jumps over sparks, but it's 
it leads to something much larger and much more promising. And I just want to mention again this this idea that a, lo a lot of rural libraries have no idea what they're missing. And I just uh, um, applaud, there are three of those six libraries that are, are working in the workshop. They And they've said it, they've said, you know, we like working with the school, it works fine. And in fact, one of them was mentioning the possibility, you know, that maybe that small school district school in town is going to move out into the middle of a cornfield. What am I going to do then for fiber? Because my community loves it. And yeah. um, so we were like, oh, well, then you can have a backup because you can have the school mm -hmm. still. And then you can also go ahead and, and apply and get fiber directly to the library. Um, the uh, One of the other uh, participants, she just said, I, I really want to have that. Uh, I love it. I want to have it, but I want to have control of it. So these are yes. just beyond. I know that we've hijacked the toolkit, but I, what I want to say is I do think that that has a lot to do with um, why. I mean, I used the toolkit in the and uh, worked with the library that was um, out west that I just was talking about. I went through the toolkit with her also. And so I've gone out when I've gone out to do things often um, independently. I just talk about that. And again, I would endorse this whole modular part of it, because sometimes you you show up somewhere and they don't really care about this, but they want to talk about this, you know, mm. and. Oh, uh, uh, you did not hijack the toolkit. This is the purpose of the toolkit, because right, yeah. so many people could not even get started. Right, even started thinking about an advanced project, uh, such as uh, what Sparks helps spark, um, uh, and other things that have happened, and even this this idea of uh, thinking about E-rate in different terms instead of looking at it in black and white to say, okay, so first we have a policy decision to make as a library. Okay, do we filter? Do we not filter? That is a policy decision. If a decision's made that filtering would be acceptable, then or in the, in the part of exploring the policy. What are the possibilities? How does this actually work? What does this do, right? Mm -hmm. Revealing that is the basis for, for wise decisions and for strategic decisions. And so this is absolutely, this is where it went beyond our wildest dreams is to see how everyone took the ball, especially Nebraska, and started <laughs> okay. doing stuff. I want to take, <laughs> take you home, Carson. I want to take you home. No, that's what I was going to say. Actually, the same thing is that the toolkit is actually this the base, the beginnings of all of this of either go, deciding to do E-Raid, getting faster fiber, whatever. We this is why we have Holly and um, and what she was talking about Cynthia, our new staff in that department. Um, we have for years here at the Library Commission. Um, you were talking about how long you've been in library. I've been at the Library Commission going to be 20 years this December. Wow. And we have always had libraries asking us, can you please help us with our technology? We don't know what we have. We don't know. And we never had the staff to do that. We never had, the, we have our own in-house IT people. That's for us. But um, it was just something we had to say, I'm sorry, we just don't have those resources. Um, but here's some, here's, some re, here's some information or see if you can find someone local or something. Um, but now we do have the staff where, you know, Things get to be adjusted, Almost. and now we have the toolkit that we just push out and tell, listen, use this, contact us, talk to Holly, talk to Cynthia, they will guide you through this. Um, I push it in all my E-rate trainings of even um, the opposite sometimes of what you're saying, um, Carson. I say, did you know your library could save 80% off of your internet bills? <laughs> what? Wow. Well, let me talk to you about internet and E-rate and look at this toolkit and talk oh. to your community and convince them that it's okay. Filtering is worth it. And I can teach you how to do it where nobody will even notice that anything's being filtered. It's, it's yeah. okay. Think about the money. I know it sounds kind of crass, but that's not, not at all. And it's so, it's so appropriate for us to have those different approaches, right? Because that, and this is, and I think when we when we show this to, especially for a small library that hasn't engaged in a decision around technology, then they everyone instantly realizes it's like, oh, I see. There's there's a couple of different uh, opinions on how to, or a couple different approaches, because we I think we share many of the same opinions, but there's different approaches that we're looking at as far as how to make a decision. And all of a sudden, what was in a black box becomes something understandable and something strategic. Whatever works, the, bring them on board. The, yep. the other I'd thing, like to, I, I, okay, go ahead, Tom, and then I'll come in. <laughs> sorry, I've got to run here in a minute, but I want to issue a conceptual challenge to Karsten and Stephanie for the toolkit version two. We know that uh, if you form a municipal consortium between school district and library and they request a new build entity number, then the infrastructure between those entities is all of a sudden E-rate eligible. 
E-Read is a school and library division. It should have said the school or library division because that's how it operates. It does. And so it's, you know, pox on the FCC for not incentivizing this, but we could be doing that much more at the local level with the extension of R&E networks. So schools obviously have that expertise in infrastructure, adopt the library, form a consortium, get a build entity number, and then throw fiber, gig, air, fiber, uh, wireless to the library, whatever. And they can actually decide their own filtering policies, but mm -hmm. they then would be a conduit from the R&E okay. down to library instead of the library connecting uh, right. on their own, which can be quite expensive. Right. So Absolutely. I'll leave that. I hope it, you know, that framework could find its way into the toolkit as another option because it is a, it doesn't require any rule changes. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's a great suggestion. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Yep. We know Thanks you have to go. We know you have to go. So thank you very much for being here. Yeah, yeah thank you. Keep up the good work, Thanks. all. We'll see Bye -bye. you so much. So we we are almost at the end of our time. I actually have to go pretty soon too. Uh, maybe we should go to any questions that uh, folks have. Um, um, uh, in the anybody community. have any questions, comments, anything you want to ask about or share about what you've done in your library? You could type into the question section, or just say unmute me. I want to say something, <laughs> um, and uh, you can uh, share that way as well. Um, so the um, I'm already waiting to see. I can't see if you're typing in, so let's just wait and see what pops up. Um, while we're waiting to see if anybody has any questions, uh, the link to the toolkit is actually uh, in our uh, session info for this uh, webinar. So you'll have a direct link to, from there to it. Um, Stephanie also shared it in uh, the chat on, in the system here, but it'll be there in the recording. Um, and what I'm gonna do now, if it's okay, Carson, I was gonna um, pull presenter control back to myself here. Absolutely, take it. You, um, there's the right button, there we go. I want to show, all right. Is it up there? All right, yes. Um, move that out of my way. We were talking about using this here at the commission, and um, well, we talked about the Sparks Grant. This is our web page for the Sparks Grant. If you're interested about it, you can go to our commission website and learn about what we did do. You just search for the word Sparks, and it comes up first. And uh, Tom was trying to remember what it was. This was a national leadership grant from IMLS, specific type of grant, as he said, for smaller amounts, uh, mainly for proof of concept type things, which we did, and we, we absolutely proved the concept, right, Holly? <laughs> yes. Total success. And then this is our broadband website at the commission. Lots of information here and under the uh, resources section. Um, wait, that wasn't the right one. No. Planning, there it is. Um, we have the link here to the toolkit. So if you come onto our page and look for something about broadband, you'll get a link to it from there and lots of other things about improving your broadband. And then our E-rate website. Um, that we have here, lots of resources about E-rate, what it is. And down here under, when you start getting into doing the forms, um, here, reload this. Yeah, there we go. The link to the uh, the toolkit is here. Links to all sorts of other resources about doing E-rate. So um, we have it all sorts of places on our site. Anywhere we can think of, I guess, that it would make sense to lead people into using it. Um, in addition, whenever I do any of my uh, trainings, this is my previous trainings and recorded sessions, it's in there and in the slides for everything as well, too. Nice. So it's all over the place. You are so awesome. Thank you. <laughs> Um, so this is just things here in Nebraska um, for our Nebraska libraries. Um, it's open for anybody to look at, but if you're in another state, see what your state might be sh doing for these kind of things too. Yes, everyone's doing it a, a, a different way, of course, uh, because um, uh, great libraries are hyper-local, -lo great state libraries are also hyper-local in how they serve uh, your specific needs. And what's really mm -hmm. interesting is um, some of the differences we have, we can, we can say, um, we have stereotypes about um, uh, Midwestern states or Western states. Um, uh, in Wyoming and in Nebraska, um, uh, you're very much in uh, have, have, have consolidated and you're very good at, at uh, consolidating help for libraries and pushing that out. A state like South Dakota actually has more in common with a, like a state in New, like the state of New Jersey, where it's more about local control. Mm -hmm. And so everyone has different challenges as far as getting this out. And so I just love the way that you've um, um, uh, that, that you're, uh, you're cross-referencing and you're using this as a component. 
um, for other programs that you're doing. And, and Stephanie and I are just so like so psyched that this is helpful. Great, glad to hear it. Um, well, it doesn't look like anybody had any desperate desperate questions urgently they wanted to ask right now, and that's okay. Um, there's a lot of good information you got here, a lot of resources to look at, and you can always reach out to um, Carson, Stephanie, Holly, Tom, me, whoever, <laughs> um, with any questions or, um, you do have. So any last words from um, you guys? Uh, thank you so much for having us, and just feel free, our email addresses are on those slides, and you can reach out for <laughs> anything, any questions, any feedback, we'd love to hear from you. Yeah, absolutely. Holly? Uh, no, no, no new words. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> just some, <clears throat> excuse me, some thank yous coming through. And Carson, yeah, just send me the sharing link to those slides and they'll be added to our archive when we put it up. We'll do. We'll get so, it out to you. Yeah. So thank you everybody for being here. Um, uh, Carson, Stephanie, Holly, and Tom, who had to leave. <laughs> yes. um, thank you everyone for um, attending. Uh, we will be um, posting the archive by the end of this week. Um, this is our Encompass Live website. So far, Encompass Live is the only thing called that on the internet. So if you use your search engine of choice and type in Encompass Live, you'll find us. No one else is allowed to use this name. <laughs> um, but these are upcoming shows, but underneath there is our link to our archives. Most recent one at the top of the list here. So um, the one for today will appear there as soon as it's processed. And there'll be a link to the recording on our YouTube channel and a link to the slides that um, Carson used. Um, well, there's also a search feature here I'll mention if you want to look at any of our other our previous shows. You can search the entire show archives or just the most recent 12 months if you want to. Um, that is because this is our full archive and I'm not going to scroll all the way down because there's just too much. Um, Encompass Live premiered in January 2009. So we have over 10 years worth of archive shows here on this page. So that's why we have a search feature now and a limit to just the most recent year if you want. Um, but we are librarians, we do archive things and keep things for historical purposes. So we always keep our information up here. But just do pay attention to an original broadcast date. There'll always be a date and everything that says when it was first done, the show, um, because some of the information will become outdated, some links will no longer work anymore, some resources will change or update or disappear, um, but we'll keep it up here for everyone as well. Um, and if you did want to see what we talked about the last time, if you look up gigabit, there's a previous show, March of last year. A couple other things about gigabit internet too. But um, if you want to see what was done the first time when we had Carson on um, and Holly and Tom were that one too. That's right. Yeah. So uh, that will be where the archive will be. Everyone who attended this morning and registered for today's show will get an email from me letting you know when it's available. We also push it out into our various social media. Uh, Encompass Live does have a Facebook page. Right here is our page where we do post reminders to things. Here's a reminder to log into today's show. When our recordings are available, we post up here information about our presenters. So um, do if you do like to use Facebook, give us a like over there. We also use Encump Live as our hashtag everywhere on, on social media. Uh, the commission has a Twitter and Instagram. I'm not sure what else we're using now, but um, as well as Facebook. So do you can uh, track us that way as well. <clears throat> so that will wrap up for today. I hope you join us next week. Our topic is discount shopping with the NLC. We have lots and lots of companies and organizations that we work with to get discounts for our libraries. You shouldn't have to pay full price for, for almost anything you do at your library. Um, so Susan Nisley, um, from our, uh, who handles all of these discount resources on databases and books and conferences, will be with us next week to talk about some deals you can get um, that way. So please do sign up for that show and any of our other upcoming sessions. Well, thank you, everybody, for being here. And hopefully we'll see you on a future Encompass Live. Thank you so Bye. much. Bye-bye, everyone. Take care. Bye.